Public Affairs very much thanks Residco, our sole corporate underwriter, for helping to make the production of this show possible. One fact I know, and it's not unique to Chicago or Illinois, and I know it drives the Democratic Party specifically crazy, but it is just a reality they cannot get away from. Law enforcement is leaning more and more to the right side because of no consequences. And whether it's perceived or reality by the Democratic Party all across this country. And until they wake up and realize that they need to start holding people accountable and stop blaming the police for everything that's wrong, and maybe start looking in the mirror and point the finger at themselves about some of society's problems. But again, it's much easier to find a scapegoat than admit you did something wrong as a politician. This isn't going to change. Our officers are going to continue to lean right and be more conservative than liberal. It's just the reality. The state's attorney assigned to this case, during closing arguments, literally said these words. These officers didn't have to do this. They had another choice. Two on-duty officers. What was their other choice? Their other choice for two on-duty police officers. I gotta look at the camera for this. Could have kept driving and called 911. The state's attorney actually said those words. Are you kidding me? Call 911. Don't do your job. Is there, the cops are supposed to call 911? Insane. But, and you well, won. What's, do you remember the assistant state's attorney who said this? Her name? I'm not going to out her. We need a complete contract. And Mayor Johnson is a labor mayor in theory and in, in basically title. So let's put the rubber to the road and make this happen. And if, if our contract gets completed, that will, because of Me Too clauses, pretty much do the, the local two fire department contract and the supervisor's contract for the police department. Those are the four big, three of the four big contracts he has outstanding in front of him right now that are expired. Yeah. The fourth one being the teachers coming up next year before the convention that he needs to address before that convention. That with Larry Snelling as the superintendent, he has the ability to explain to people, including the mayor, about use of force and why maybe some of the rhetoric that the mayor has used to this point probably wasn't the best choice of words. And as we go forward here, I would hope that his perspective from the fifth floor of City Hall changes a little bit and has a little better understanding and appreciation for the work and the literal discretion that our officers use every single day about use of force. Okay, so, okay, you were, so you you were at the uh, the Judiciary Committee, right. and Lieutenant John Garrido. This was the hearing that you posted. Let, you let people use your facilities about correct. a week ago. So, and just so people know, the Repu the Jim Jordan from chair of the Criminal Justice Committee let they wanted to look at crime in Chicago. Invited all their members, Democrat and Republican. Democrats stayed home. Republicans came out, and then, as you were saying, so as Lieutenant John Garrido pointed out in that hearing. Vehicle stops by officers of the Chicago Police Department are at about 30% of what they used to be, 30%. That means we make far less vehicle stops. That translates to criminals knowing that they can do whatever they want. And why is that? Because we have seven different layers of scrutiny and oversight. We have a prosecutor who has made it her mission to put police scalps on her wall before she walks out of that office. We have had, until recently, a department and a superintendent who did not give a damn and did not back up officers routinely, and that just made officers a shell of who they formerly were and did not Wait, want who, to who engage. Did not, who did not? David Brown. He was the former superintendent. Correct. And what did he and do? Eric, they did, he did, they did not back up the men and women of this department. He didn't have their backs. Absolutely not. So a perfect example of David Brown, and you could research the even media attached to this incident. There was a carjacking that was going on for well over 40 minutes. There were three different attempts to stop this vehicle, and the chases were called off while the helicopter was pursuing from overhead. It ended up on the west side of Chicago in a gas station where the offender bailed out of the car, and another 15, 16 year old, I don't remember exactly how old he was, ended up running away with the gun in his hand and gets shot in the gas station parking lot, in the back, as he's running away, no doubt. And all David Brown said to the media was, that officer can answer for his actions. That's the superintendent of police backing up our officers, and you wonder why nobody wants to do their job because of that. Well, I think we're at a different day. I don't want to keep looking back, but it really kind of highlighted why vehicle stops specifically 
which is how the majority of our weapons are seized off of the streets. And again, we seize and recover as many guns as New York and L.A. combined every single year, year after year. We are talking 10, 11, 12,000 weapons every year taken off the streets of Chicago. The majority of those are interactions with an offender. Now, whether Kim Fox charges them or not is almost secondary to the point that these almost always never resolve in a shooting where an officer is shooting somebody. It just doesn't happen. So that whole dynamic and, and storyline is BS to begin with. We do phenomenal work when we're allowed to do them, and we do make the streets safer. Who's stopping you from doing them? Right now, right now, as of October 4th, who is stopping you from doing them? Well, right now, we just had an acquittal of two of our officers, an officer and a sergeant, after Kim Fox decided to charge them for a shooting last July on 18th Street, where there were five gangbangers out on the street with a weapon. Now, these officers knew something was strange at 7 a.m., on 18th Street where it just didn't look right and stopped to investigate and it turned into something else where there was an armed attack and the 16 year old who ended up firing and trying to assassinate these two officers after they shot his friend who they thought had the weapon originally um, and he was standing right next to as they approached the car in ambush style the officers shoot out the vehicle and shoot this kid she thought it was logical to charge these two police officers with aggravated battery and official misconduct and put their life through hell that was Kim Fox and the judge said otherwise the judge said they had a very simple assumption that this was an armed defender approaching their car and they had every right to defend themselves. It should have never been brought to trial. It should have never even been charged. So she's there for another, well, another year unless she leaves, right? It Kim gets Fox. better. The state's attorney assigned to this case during closing arguments literally said these words. These officers didn't have to do this. They had another choice. Two on-duty officers. What was their other choice? Their other choice for two on-duty police officers. i got to look at the camera for this. Could have kept driving and called 911. The state's attorney actually said those words. Are you kidding me? Call 911. Don't do your job. Is there, the cops are supposed to call 911? Insane. But, and you well, won. What was it? Do you remember the assistant state's attorney who said this? Or her name? I'm not going to out her. But again, well, she deserves it. It's a public statement. It, it was it was a pretty bizarre argument to make. I don't name? necessarily I don't necessarily think that she made the actual argument. I think it was given to her to read by Kim Fox. No, well, no, her assistant or what was the decision to charge these two officers even after a proffered statement? And a proffered statement is simply, I'm coming in with my client as an attorney, and we are going to answer your questions to try and add some color okay. to a picture so you don't charge my officer. You know exactly what happened. Okay. And even after that proffered statement, Lynn McCarthy, the number three at the Cook County State's Attorney Office, pushed for charging these two officers. She was sitting in the trial the whole time How in long the front was this, this was last week. This just happened. So this is under Correct. Brandon Johnson. Well, no, they were charged under under under, under Lori Lightfoot. Lightfoot. Correct, and David Brown. And, and Lori, as far as she knew, that was okay. She she of course she's not the state's attorney. No, but she but didn't she, come out in her defense. She could have. She Correct. was the mayor. Correct. She was a former prosecutor. Well, she supposedly. went to the University of Chicago Law School. She went to the University of Michigan. Lori, if I'm being unfair, you come on and you explain this because. People thought, I, I thought, with those credentials not knowing you, in this situation, you would act quite differently. She's got to go poison the minds at Harvard first, though. So give her I some mean, time. How much are, okay, so the point for you is, how do you change this? You're the guy who's president of the Fraternal Order of Police, and if you don't change it, who does? Well, Again, I think we have an opportunity, like we said at the top of the show here, that with Larry Snelling as the superintendent, he has the ability to explain to people, including the mayor, about use of force and why maybe some of the rhetoric that the mayor has used to this point probably wasn't the best choice of words. And as we go forward here, I would hope that his perspective from the fifth floor of City Hall changes a little bit and has a little better understanding and appreciation for the work and the literal discretion that our officers use every single day about use of force. Listen, there's nothing pretty about use of force. More time, 99 times out of 100, it is not pretty when officers have to use a force on an offender in any way, shape, or form. Most times people cringe at that, but that's just the sad reality. It's like boxing. 
I mean, someone's going to get hit. Sorry, it's just the nature of the beast. Um, but I think Larry can give a very clear overview for people to understand and look at the camera very directly and stand up for the officers. I'm not telling them it's, and everybody knows, we don't expect it to be a blanket defense of every single thing an officer does. If he thinks it's wrong, we expect him to say that he thinks it's wrong. And if we disagree with him, he knows I'm gonna say I disagree with him. We're never gonna agree 100% of the time, and that's okay. But the dialogue and the opportunity is in front of us, and we can have some hope for the future that this will change, especially with the state's attorney race less than about a year away. So you're saying, yeah, with the right guy, if Larry Snelling, I really, with all due respect, it's clear from what we've heard here and what we know before, David Brown was not the right guy for Chicago to be the police chief when Larry Lightfoot brought him in. Would that be clear? That, I have to regrettably agree with you, and I, I've, I'm sad to say I was completely wrong about the man. I was extremely hopeful when he was named superintendent and he couldn't have been a bigger disappointment. More importantly, now you think Larry Snelling is the right guy, right? Yes, because I think the difference between David Brown and Larry Snelling, at least the, the most glaring one, the first conversation I had with David Brown is said, I am not a political creature. I will not get involved in politics. But he did. He did whatever the mayor told him to do. That's involved in politics. I think Superintendent Snelling has not only the seniority on this job and the reputation of being a straight shooter, that he doesn't need this job. So whether the mayor gave him an unending leash or a short leash or somewhere in the middle, I still expect him to call balls and strikes as he sees them, even if sometimes people don't like what he has to say, including the mayor. And if he gets fired because of it, because he might say something that the mayor doesn't agree with eventually over time, I think he'll walk away with his head up held high. That's what I expected from David Brown. Because he told me if I go out, I'm going out on my terms, not someone else's. And he didn't. He ran away like a coward in the middle of the night back to Dallas. So, so that, that's a good answer. And I, I don't mean necessarily I agree with you. That addresses my question. What has to change? And you've told people, our viewers, I think, a little bit about what has to change. And you're hopeful that that change has begun. But it would seem like... That's not enough. You got to get a state's attorney who's quite different from Kim Fox. You know of anybody who's running for state's attorney in 2024 who fits that description? Ah, uh, we're still accepting applications, so to speak. But you're I still looking say, over the field. Correct. But I used the other analogy. You know, it, but is that crucial? If that doesn't happen, Snelling's not good as he might be. If he is as you described, that's not enough, right? Correct. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but. But the question is, to really start to correct this situation, which we've described, crime is completely out of control, you need a good police chief, superintendent of police in Chicago, but you also need a prosecutor, a state's attorney of Cook County who believes in prosecuting and believes in treating criminals like criminals. You need one more thing, too. What else? You need a happy workforce, which means a complete contract, not a half-done contract. I thought we had this. I can't keep track. I thought Paul Vallis negotiated this and phase one. it was his claim to fame. You still don't have a good contract? It's not complete. We did phase one. Did you but agree to it, but you're still working on it? We what? agreed to phase one, which phase is one. the primary financial components and benefits yeah. and the accountability issues the city needed, according to get phase one done. What the promise phase two was going to be done. Lightfoot never had any intention on getting phase two done before the election. It's phase two. Phase two is the rest. Uh, most of the, uh, the, the predominant amount of our proposals. The city got a lot of what they asked for as far as accountability. You know, the money's easy. We could always talk about the money. Yeah. Um, but there's things in the processes of the contract that needed clarity, like arbitration for termination cases. And again, this is a whole sticking point right now that's in front of the city council because the arbitrator gave us an award of going to arbitration or the police board for termination cases. The contract was very clear. It was always by agreement. The FOP always had the ability to opt out of that agreement and have the ability to go to arbitration instead of only the police board. For whatever reason, it never exercised that option until now. And now it's like we horse trader, we hoodwink, we did something shady and, and the arbitrator gave us some, oh my God, pie in the sky benefit. No, he didn't. All he did was interpret the law and things that he had already done with other jurisdictions and give us what we rightly under collective bargaining. So you have that, now what happens? 
Well, the city council still has to vote on it. And there's other issues. So if the city council doesn't approve it, you don't have a contract. Well, it goes, well, not a complete contract. Not a complete contract. Well, so, it, yeah. it could end okay. up in the courts. But there's a bigger package. My point is this. There's other provisions, and the interest arbitration part of it for phase two has not been completed. We need a complete contract. And Mayor Johnson is a labor mayor in theory and in, in basically title. So let's put the rubber to the road and make this happen. And if, if our contract gets completed, that will, because of Me Too clauses, pretty much do the, the local two fire department contract and the supervisor's contract for the police department. Those are the four big, three of the four big contracts he has outstanding in front of him right now that are expired. Mm -hmm. The fourth one being the teachers coming up next year before the convention that he needs to address before that convention. Okay, I don't want to get too, bit, too in the weeds. That's important. Hopefully people will understand that. But Jeff, it translates to a workforce. And a happier workforce delivers a better product. This is, this is the morale of the Chicago Police Department, is Correct. what you're saying. If they, these things are not handled well... You're going to have a disgruntled workforce. You don't have a good morale. You don't have a good morale. You don't have proactive policing. You don't have proactive policing. None of the stuff that Wirepoint is talking about gets fixed. Correct. Yeah, and what else? Anything else? So let's just say you got a state's attorney, somehow, Democrat or Republican, elected in 2024, who wanted to prosecute and do it right. If there's a bad cop, prosecute the bad cop. But if there's a good cop, don't prosecute the good cop, right? I guess, I don't know, I went to law school. It seems to me that's doing it right, right? One more component. What else do you need? Chief judge. Chief judge? Who's the chief judge? Tim Evans needs to go. Why? Because it doesn't, matter what, it doesn't matter what Kim Fox does, in large part sometimes, because the chief judge has authority to set the guidelines for the criminal courts in this county. And no cash bail now as an option, it's going to be a big, big problem. And the chief judge has historically sided with the same policies that Kim Fox has been championing. It's almost like a tag team. And until you get the chief judge out of there, which, you know, we, we, we did have an effect on that, that race last year when he was up for retention. You did. Uh, not we, not we, to we, block him, but not, you say... Well, well you... We, we, we didn't get too far off. Um, we were within 10 points of getting him out. Really? And I mean, we was didn't that, really was put that a, a lot retention of effort. thing? Correct. Right? Yeah. So he was almost not retained. And think about how crooked this county is. And it's called Crook County for a reason. Yeah. They vote on the Chief Justice of Cook County before the election of his retention is even held. So you're already giving him a post not even know if he's going to be there, right. assuming, I guess, that he's going to be there a couple months later. He, he, can, run as, good he can run as the recently re-elected chief judge before he got elected, re-elected as a judge, right? I could be re-elected as chief judge before I'm even retained as a circuit judge. So is it too late? you got to wait another four years? How do you get him out of there? His next his next vote, we're definitely going to make it a very concerted effort to get Tim, Tim Evans out of office. Is that 2026 or what? Yes. Okay. Wait a second, his next vote, you just said his next vote, you'll make it a concerted effort to get Kim Fox out of office? No, Tim Evans. Oh, Tim Evans, okay. Oh, obviously Kim Fox is walking away. That's what I'm saying. But yeah. again, that's not where it needs to stop. So Tim you're Evans, still going to push on this. I mean, he's probably approaching 83, so external forces might intervene. Well, I'm not wishing any old well, Nor am I, okay. but changes need to happen. And that's because it's important because how many judges does he control as chief judge? I don't have the number, but it's a lot. 800, 600, something it's, like that. It's a lot. These are the trial judges. They're making decisions on probation. They're make, because he's on made bond. it clear on bond, the simplest thing. Because right now, it's not a matter, there's no cash ship, but I'm told, we're told, under the Safety Act, the judge has a discretion. If you are a dangerous career criminal, you can be detained, right? Correct. Correct. But that ain't going to happen if, 99 if, times out if, of if, if Judge Evans is there and he's controlling these 800 judges, it ain't going to happen. Correct. <coughs> Listen, they just released, and it was very widespread on news uh, sometime last year with an, an idiot maniac with a long rifle on the expressway trying to carjack cars in broad daylight, mind you. I believe it was on the Dan Ryan. That person was held in bond up until last week where now they were released. Who, who, just, who, who? The judge released. The judge made that decision. Was the Cook County prosecutor asking for that person to be detained? It's almost like it's an automatic magic button at this point. Unless you shot somebody, the parading judge, around. The judge is going to just say, you're not dangerous, right? Yes, you're not dangerous. Standing in the middle but of But I'm just wondering, uh, and back in the old fashion days, you know, and I used to practice, the system was there was a judge, and there was a prosecutor, and there was a public defender. As I recall, the prosecutor could ask 
in this situation for the for the um, the the person accused to be detained and the public defender could take the other point of view and then the judge could decide I just want to know was there somebody from the state's attorney's office asking for that person to be detained no no because she the the assistant state's attorney and the state's attorney Kim Fox didn't think this person as you described was dangerous to the community apparently not standing in the middle of a crowded Chicago Expressway in broad daylight with a long rifle trying to basically carjack people isn't dangerous and the judge sua sponte even though the prosecutor didn't ask for that could do justice and say I'm going to detain him but he didn't do that right agreed so folks um, we're sort of wrapping up because it's been great a little longer than I thought we hope we'll be able to run two parts you know because um, because you've solved everything here yeah right above and beyond the call of duty as because no seriously how many people in the city of Chicago whatever their office have answered the question what can we do to reverse this out of control crime you've said well you got the police you got the police superintendent who can do the right thing you may get a state's attorney who can prosecute and do the right thing you may have a chief judge who can get the 800 or 600 judges certain Cook County to do the right thing in 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 really have I got it right? That's what you think. And the police morale has to be good. You have to have maybe 11,000 police you have now. Maybe you want to. It's no good to get it up to 12,000 if you've got the wrong system, right? Or the wrong applicants. Or the wrong applicants. You got to get the right people there, the right morale, and everything else. But thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I mean, John Catanzari, you've solved everything. Yeah, right. If you can just bring this off. Okay, you come back, you come back often because you know what you're doing. Bring some friends, you know. For. We need to get to know, I kind of ask you, and I'm, I'm going to get in trouble for taking one more, one more minute, but I've got to ask you, what are these, you've got about 11,000 sworn police officers now? Correct. What do they think? Can you describe them as a group? What would they think about what we've been talking about? Or would they just say, what do they think? Something else. What can you tell them about those 11,000 sworn police officers in the city of Chicago? Here, here's one fact I know, and it's not unique to Chicago or Illinois. And I know it drives the Democratic Party specifically crazy, but it is just a reality they cannot get away from. Law enforcement is leaning more and more to the right side because of no consequences. And whether it's perceived or reality by the Democratic Party, all across this country. And until they wake up and realize that they need to start holding people accountable and stop blaming the police for everything that's wrong, and maybe start looking in the mirror and point the finger at themselves about some of society's problems. But again, it's much easier to find a scapegoat than admit you did something wrong as a politician. This isn't going to change. Our officers are going to continue to lean right and be more conservative than liberal. It's just the reality. They may be conservatively, I should say liberally social, but conservative when it comes to finances and crime every day, twice on Sunday. Okay, John Catanzara, president of the Fraternal Order of Police, Lodge Number no. 7, also known as the Chicago FOP. You come back. Will do. And you come back next week and every week to Public Affairs. 